You are listening to Arcane Carolinas, an exploration of the Carolinas folklore, legends, myths, and modern weird. Each episode, we examine the historical context of our topic and aim to preserve some of the stories that help make this part of the world such a fascinating place. Hey y'all, Michael here. I want to jump in at the beginning with a couple of words of gratitude and more info on our upcoming live events. First up, I cannot say enough things to thank my amazing friend Michelle and the staff and patrons of Black Mountain Library and the friends of Black Mountain Library and all the people who turned out for that appearance in early May. We had an amazing time talking about a very weird story of Brown Mountain and its well-known lights, and I am really looking forward to sharing that with y'all in spooky season this fall. That said, if you're a Patreon supporter, Charlie and I will also be doing a Patreon-only version of the same story in June or July, just because it's such a weird, fun story that I really want to get to tell it to Charlie, and I thought, why not? Let Patreon supporters also get to see the slide deck and stuff like that. It's going to be a lot of fun. Second, I had an absurdly great time at Carolina Fear Fest over Memorial Day weekend, and I want to take a second to thank every one of y'all who stopped by to chat. I especially want to thank everybody who took free t-shirts, because I was really tired of toting those around in the backseat of my car. (laughs) I am really honest with (laughs) y'all. There were so many people who were like, really? T-shirts are free? And I was like, I will help you carry if you take more t-shirts. But for real, our second year there was just as great as our first, and I really appreciated everyone who said kind things and shared some of their own favorite stories and legends and movie monsters with me. The next live recording will be me flying solo at Congregate in Winston-Salem in July, but I'll have two guest co-hosts with me. Tally Johnson, who's going to have some awesome ghost stories from the Triad area to share, and Gary Mitchell, who is one of our dearest friends and longest time supporters. He co-hosts his own show, The Podcast of Amontillado, where he talks about horror movies and horror books and different things that he and his co-host love about the horror genre. And he's had Charlie and me each join him to talk about different horror movies and stories that we also love. Given that Tally will be joining me, if you want to check out some of Tally's own work, His books on haunted sites and ghost stories are just amazing. He takes the same approach we do, where he really digs into the real history of a place and talks about how it might or might not support a given legend. And when he goes to a place and nothing happens, he says so. But when he goes to a place and something does happen, let me tell you, that is the best. It takes a guy as talented as Tally to tell a story about a ghost cat on his mother-in-law's kitchen counter and make it stick and he does it. So there are a couple of links to his books in the show notes, and I encourage you all to pick it up. That same weekend, I'll be teaching a class on genre blending at the Saga Genre Writing Conference, which is partnered with Congregate this year and is happening just across the Skyway in the neighboring hotel. And speaking of writing and horror, there are initial plans underway for another group reading by members of the North Carolina chapter of HWA. This one will be in downtown Durham sometime in the first half of August, so I'll keep you all updated. And last, but certainly not least, Charlie and I will be at Arcana in Durham, North Carolina on September 26th for our annual spooky season kickoff, and we absolutely cannot wait. That's the next time the two of us will get to hang out together with folks, and we are really looking forward to it. I suspect we're going to do a free ticket thing just to make sure we don't violate any fire codes. So we just need to make sure we don't get our canna in any trouble. So keep an eye out for that. If we do decide to do that, y'all will be the first to know. And on that topic, if you work at or otherwise can speak on behalf of a library in the Carolinas and you like having presentations like that, get in touch. Send us an email at arcanecarolinas at gmail.com. We can't guarantee we'll be able to do it, and we both have very demanding day jobs, and I do conventions and readings and other stuff as a writer outside of doing Arcane Carolinas, and we both have lives and homes and stuff we like to do outside of this. But when we have the opportunity, we really enjoy doing that sort of thing, and we're already talking to a couple of libraries about stuff in 2025. You know, we joke a lot about the bucket of ideas and how we worry sometimes we're going to run out of topics. And it came up in conversation with some people at Carolina Fear Fest this weekend. 
So I thought I'd share that we have a slate of episodes for the next couple of years already laid out. And we each have, and I'm not exaggerating with this, hundreds more topics to consider beyond that. We are simply never going to run out of stories in the Carolinas. This place is too weird, and I wouldn't have it any other way. So thanks for listening. Thanks for coming out to libraries and supporting local libraries and conventions and being part of the conversation and talking with us about stuff that we all love. And now, on with the show. Hello, Michael. Hello, Charlie. (laughs) Welcome back. (laughs) I don't know why that's so funny to me, but it is for some reason. I'll stop doing it when you stop laughing at it. Okay. (laughs) Welcome back to Arcane Carolinas. I'm your co-host, Charlie Mewshaw. I am your other co-host, multi-award-winning novelist and single award-winning podcaster. I still find that really funny. I don't know. I might cut it out of the episode, but I do still find it really funny. Michael G. Williams. I like it. Welcome to a spicy episode of Arcane Destinations. (laughs) The content isn't spicy, but I'm feeling particularly spicy today. (laughs) You had a spicy day yesterday. I did. I had a real roller coaster of a day yesterday. Sometimes day job stuff is very challenging. Yeah. And for me, Michael just had to to let you see a little bit behind the scenes. Michael just had to listen to me complain about some very first world problems. (laughs) For probably, what is it? 11 minutes. Looking at the clock, it was 11 minutes. Yeah, but for people who are into like internet numerology stuff, that does mean that in the time that we are recording this, we started at 11.11. So it's going to be a great episode. Time to make a wish, 11.11. So we're going to open things up. This is an Arcane Destinations episode. We will get into that, but we're going to start with an update and correction from the Pugin's Porch episode. We got an awesome message from a former chef at Pugin's Porch. Oh. And... I asked her if she would be okay with me sharing some of the things that she shared, and she said absolutely. So we'll just jump right into it. I'm just going to kind of laundry list it. The hotel across the street is apparently also haunted as well. All right. If you sit on the porch at the restaurant, you can sometimes see the hotel ghost. Oh, I like that. Yeah. I especially like that there's like a feature of sitting on the eponymous porch. Yeah, like looking and seeing weird stuff. But here is where I think she references that we got a little wrong. It's not a cute Casper the Ghost friendly haunting at Pugin's porch. Okay. The kitchen staff in particular are subjected to things flying across the kitchen and staff have been pushed down the stairs. That's not good. Nope. And doors will occasionally lock themselves. Oh. So a guest was reportedly locked in the bathroom, like during service, like during regular business hours. Yeah. And Zoe showed herself. Oh. And this is before the era of pics of Zoe being everywhere and being readily accessible. Oh. And she was able to describe a very similar woman and reportedly the more malicious encounters tend to center on female patrons and staff. That is really interesting. To directly quote the person that sent us this, she is not female friendly. Oh, wow. A hostess on a Sunday morning service was coming down the stairs before they opened and was pushed down the stairs and ended up breaking her leg. Oh, God. Yeah, this was in the nineties. So there were cameras inside at that point and they could actually watch it and see where it wasn't like, Oh, she tripped and fell. It looked like she was pushed. Oh, that is a very unpleasant. There was a sous chef doing a produce order in the walk-in and was locked inside and it's a slide lock and everyone else was gone for the night. So the guy stayed the whole night in the walk-in until seven the next morning. Oh, that's extremely dangerous. Mm Mm-hmm. Their walk-in needs an emergency release. I'm sure they've updated since then. I'm sure. Glass coffee pots flying across the pastry room, shattering against walls. And apparently, the oldest running employee who actually opened the restaurant had the most stories. This was before she worked there. (laughs) And he had recently passed. This is quoting her. We believe he had an understanding with Zoe because on the day he passed, there was reportedly so much activity in the restaurant, they had to close it down. Dang. 
I find that interesting. One of the things that it suggests for me is what if this spirit's objection is chiefly to there being unfamiliar people in her former home? Yeah, that's the way I interpret it. Yeah, it's not. I don't know. I'm not psychic about this ghost or anything. I've never had a conversation with it, but this is the first thing that comes to mind. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to acknowledge that because whenever we do get a correction like that, that is thoughtfully framed and not. You were wrong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you big dummy. Mm hmm. Yeah, you know, I do like to acknowledge that. So I'll use her first name. Thank you, Jen. That was awesome. I was really excited to get that. She has a lot of good stories and we have an invitation to hang out next time we're in Charleston. All right. Thank you, Jen. We really do appreciate you taking the time to write and frame it the way you did. That was awesome. Yeah. Thank you very much. On to the episode from Alabama. All right. Alabama. I've driven through Alabama, but I've never been to Alabama. The Yellowhammer State. All right. Named after the state bird, Alabama is also known as the heart of Dixie and the Cotton State. Okay. The state tree is the longleaf pine, which is a bit of a Carolina tie, right? Totally. Originally home to 37 Native American tribes, present-day Alabama was a Spanish... To blah, blah, blah. You can tell I haven't done this in a while. <laughs> um... <laughs> <laughs> it was originally home to 37 Native American tribes, and present-day Alabama was a Spanish territory beginning in the 16th century until the French took it over in the early 18th century, and then the British claimed the territory in 1763 until, obviously, they lost it in the American Revolutionary War, and it just became a part of the United States. All right. So pretty typical story for southern states spanish first french british winds up just being american mm -hmm. <laughs> we all wind up american eventually michael <laughs> <laughs> i know looking at our stats that there are at least some listeners who just went oh really <laughs> <laughs> keep listening it'll eventually just it'll just happen one day you'll just wake up and be like oh look at that my passport changed colors you'll wake up and say man i'm craving grits <laughs> right. so spain held mobile as part of the spanish west florida until 1813 mm -hmm. and it was actually i said it became a part of america it was actually recognized as a state in 1819 mm mm-hmm uh, during the antebellum period, Alabama was a producer of corn and widely used African slave labor. In 1861, the state seceded from the Union to become a part of the Confederate States of America, with Montgomery acting as its first capital. It obviously rejoined the Union pretty quickly in 1868. <laughs> yeah, this didn't really work out for them. No, it didn't. Hmm. As I hmm. sip my water with my pinky out. <laughs> How'd that go for you? It'd go good. We're going to get a comment that I get to hide on Facebook. Oh, yeah. It's going to be wonderful. I love those. So anyway, you can definitely tell I haven't done this in a while. <laughs> I'm not pulling punches. So after the Civil War, Alabama hit decades of economic hardship. Oh, yeah. Agriculture and a few cash crops were the main drivers of the state's economy. And all of a sudden, slavery was illegal. So... Oh, one thing that the state legislatures did was they began employing Jim Crow laws from the late 19th century up into the 60s. Mm -hmm. But that kind of blew up because there was obviously high profile events like the Selma to Montgomery March. The state then became a major focal point for the civil rights movement. Yeah. So that's the early history up into the mid 1900s. It is important to note that during and after World War II, Alabama grew and the economy had begun diversification, which I think serves in no small part to the civil rights movement being able to take anchor there. As the state grew and more opportunities grew, people began to push back. Yes. So the economy diversified. NASA established the Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville and began developing the aerospace industry, leaned heavily into automotive, finance, tourism, manufacturing, even mineral extraction, like mining. Yeah. More recently, healthcare, education, retail, and technology have all began to grow. It has a very diverse geography. Uh, the north is dominated by the mountainous Tennessee Valley, and the south has Mobile Bay. 
And do you know what is in the middle of all of this, Michael? I do not. In the middle of Alabama is the Bear Creek Swamp. The Bear Creek Swamp? So the Bear Creek Swamp is a big old swamp that sits between two highways, and it is a source of many local legends and haunted history. Okay. Is it B-E-A-R or B-A-R-E? B-E-A-R. Okay. Right. Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) That kind of bear. Yes. It's important to me that we distinguish. Yeah. Of the John Walters variety. I'm just immediately thinking of a dirty shame where, look, bears. (laughs) (laughs) Indeed. So this is one of those places, man, where there's no single tell-all narrative. Like, there isn't a definitive Bear Creek Swamp. This happened. This is why it's haunted. This is the haunting. It's one of those weird places that we've talked about where it is chock full of local stories and widely acknowledged as a spooky place or a place not to be. But you can't really put a finger on one specific thing. You can't hang your hat on any one of these stories. Hmm. I think this is something that we observe as we talk about different places in the Carolinas, outside the Carolinas, whatever. Is that some places are defined by an instigating event. And so that could be Bladenboro with the Vampire Beast. But then some places are just nexuses for the weird. And Brown Mountain is a good example of that. You are a national forest. Yes. They got goblins and Bigfoots. <laughs> They've got like ghosts of horrible people. <laughs> That's the sign. We got we got goblins and Bigfoots. <laughs> Asterix and small print. And a few select ghosts of terrible people. <laughs> yes. What I want is a population sign that says population 10,000 people, 14 goblins. <laughs> One big foot. <laughs> that would be amazing. We should make one and put it somewhere on the woods. Go to terrible people, unknown, indeterminate. <laughs> or have it say one, but then put like the null and void sign of it and then like a date, like it was Ghostbusters. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that would be amazing. Okay. So I'm going to laundry list these. Yeah, go for it. Because there's a lot. So some of the sightings of of ghostly activity involve Creek and other First Nation warriors who originally called the middle of Alabama home. Mm -hmm. There's the always popular sightings of Civil War era soldiers. Of course. There is no Blackbeard. Thank you. (laughs) There's one that I like because it has a hook, and that is sightings of early white settlers, Mm -hmm. one of whom, this is a specific one, is a woman who has lost her child. And if you say, we have your baby three times in the swamp, she'll approach you. Oh, I like that as a Candyman kind of thing. Yeah. And she approaches you aggressively. It's not like a, hey, how's it going? (laughs) It's like a, yeah, don't imagine she thinks you're being helpful. Some people on, on the internet have said this. That if you say we have your baby three times and she's and you don't see her, you might still hear laughter or screaming. Oh, I like this. I like that a lot. Yeah. There's at least one variant that says that the father also appears, but that's very not as much detail. Mm -hmm. I like this next one. Humanoid figures four feet tall will rush at cars as they drive through. In a particular place or just in general? In the swamp. In the swamp. All right. I like yeah. that because, like, lizard man vibes. Yeah, totally. I want to know more about what humanoid figures means. Shadow right. figures, like shadowy oh, figures. Okay. Okay. So they're not alien grays necessarily, and they're not like <laughs> lizard people, and they're not whatever. Right. You'll like this one. This is right up your alley. Floating orbs of light that don't match the time of day or type of sunlight. Oh, yeah, I like that a lot, too. Yeah, that's something that's obviously not Fox Fire, something that's not obviously swamp gas. See, I would I'll argue with you on that one. I don't think enough people have seen swamp gas phenomena to make that decision. And we're in a literal swamp. Okay, 
admittedly, yes, this is these are the perfect conditions to actually say it's probably just swamp gas. <laughs> right. I am extending uh, the benefit of the doubt to these reports and saying if somebody looks at it and says it doesn't match what we should see, then I'm willing to accept that it's of the strange. Yeah. You'll like this next one, too. This is another Michael thing. Phantom cars that speed down the road and disappear when they reach the edge of the swamp. Oh, I love it. Yes, I like that a lot. That is really something that I would be interested to see myself sometime. Are the cars always the same car? Are they a particular type of car? No, there's again, these are so broad and there's so many. OK, no matter what you're into in the strange or paranormal, if you want to use that label, you can find it. You can find somebody online saying they saw this here. OK, I personally, my preference would be that it'd be moonshiners just yeah. because I think that would be really interesting. That'd be a lot more interesting than some person who's just has too much money and has bought a really fancy car. <laughs> you know what I like for the cars? I like people that were killed and taken out in their car and then buried in the swamp, like driven into the swamp. Ooh, I like that too. Yeah. Is that from the departed? Put the body in the mash. When I say put the body in the mash, you put the body in the mash. <laughs> My question would be, are the cars going into the swamp or are the cars coming out of the swamp? Because I feel like that could be tied to the origin of how the spirit ever got there in the first well, place. Well, they do seem to be going out. Because they disappear at the edge. Oh. So that's why, for me, they're victims. Either they crashed and they sunk in the swamp. Yeah. Or Norman Bates style car gets mm -hmm. put in the pond. Yeah. Look at that. Two movie references and one little bu bullet point. <laughs> so there's also... This is this this one also made me think of you with your tales of uh, throwing dynamite down mine shafts. <laughs> there are reports of random booms and other loud noises coming from deep in the swamp. Ooh, I love that too. I'm a big fan of phantom the boom sounds and also phantom hums, stuff like mm -hmm. that. That's a really interesting phenomenon. And and like sure, it's almost always tied to industrial activity somewhere far away. And it just happens the conditions are exactly right for that sound to carry. But I really love that as a phenomenon anyway. Here's the final one. If you stop your car on the swamp road in the middle of the night, it might not start again till morning. Ooh. That just sounds like you need to get a better battery, but <laughs> my hope is that it's not because tiny shadow mechanics are coming out of the forest <laughs> and little, disabling vehicles. Those little Looney Tunes gremlins. <laughs> little shadow saboteurs. Oh man. <laughs> I'm also curious with the Creek Warriors. My assumption is that the answer is many, but is there a specific event that might have been the instigating event for that? Was there a particular time when they were at war with colonists or something like that? Yeah. So, <laughs> yes, Michael, thank you. We do not share notes. So there isn't one specific paranormal story tied to the creek, right? But there was a massive effort to push the majority of Alabama's indigenous people off the territory to make room mm -hmm. for the plantations. And by the 1830s, that was done. So like it was mm -hmm. just a massive push with manifest destiny ideas. Yeah. To get them all out as quickly as possible. So yeah, there was actually, there was a giant push and by the 1830s, it was done. So pretty quickly. Okay. Yeah. And so I would imagine then that manifestations of those ghosts are depictions of those events where they're attempting to resist that genocide against them. Another incident. Mm -hmm. This one was more industrial than agricultural, but there was a town, Prattville, first county seat of Autauga. And one of the towns that border the Bear Creek Swamp was founded in 1819 by a guy named Daniel Pratt. And he put his textile gin on the banks of the Autauga River which fed into the swamp and that drove a lot of people away from the area. Mm -hmm. So that, that's like hyper local. So it's, we talk about general larger patterns, but by 1819, there is like a hyper local incident. Okay, cool. Or in industrialization. We'll say a hyper local industrialization. Yeah. It makes me think of the Jersey devil episode that we did and mm -hmm. the pine barrens and the idea that there are places on the edges of these vast unpeopled places that are still the natural world and the human interaction with that the human occupation of that sort of liminal space that's one of my favorite yeah. kinds of stories but the human occupation of that sort of liminal space leads to 
weird stuff happening. People being in a place where maybe people were never supposed to be is one of my favorite tropes in stories. Mm -hmm. And so the idea there is just this zone of weird and there is human occupation at its edge. And the people at that edge see weird stuff is one mm -hmm. of my favorite kinds of phenomenon. I love it. I'm here for that. There is a fictional story that is not true floating around about a plantation that backed up to the swamp in antebellum era. There is no record of that being true. <laughs> okay. So just for anybody listening, be like, they didn't talk about the plantation because it wasn't real. There was significant action in the region during the Civil War, especially near the Selma area mm -hmm. to the west. Mm hmm. So that would certainly explain the Civil War ghosts. But it's interesting to mention that there have been modern incidents as well, like current era incidents. A local farmer went into the swamp in 1931 and was never found. Okay. Not hard to do in a large swamp, but that happened. Man from Prattville lost control of his car, died in a crash on the Bear Creek Road in 1958. Mm-hmm. Three grade school boys got lost four miles into the swamp when they went for a walk in 1960. They emerged nine hours later, completely fine, with no way to explain how they got lost or what happened. Huh. Were they just totally amnesiatic about it or had they not perceived the time having passed? They were just like, mm, I don't know. Like They knew that a lot of time had passed, but they couldn't explain how they got lost or, or anything. Mm, just like the landscape was not familiar to them all yeah. of a sudden. Yep. Two men murdered a guy in 1977 and buried him under a log. Well, all right. <laughs> Nobody will look for him here. Use rocks next time, fellas. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, let me, let me, uh, hold on. Don't murder next time, fellas. Yeah, <laughs> do better. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> there people are like, huh, interesting take, Charlie. <laughs> Take notes, kids. In 1990, two women beat a guy up, stabbed him, and left him for dead at the edge of the swamp over $250 that he had in his wallet. Wow. Okay. And in 2014, this is the one you'll find most prominently. There was a really good prank that really upped the creepiness of the swamp. Almost two dozen old, worn-out porcelain dolls appeared in the swamp tied to bamboo shoots next to the road. I have the greatest look of delight on my face because I love everything about that. That's messed up. That's really messed up. And I love that happened. I love specifically that happened and did not happen to me, to be clear. <laughs> I am savoring the fact that somebody else drove into, walked through, whatever, boated through the swamp and saw creepy dolls tied to bamboo. I think that I would have had a really good opportunity to practice my three point turning skills if that had happened to me, because I would have been like, never mind, I'll go the long way around. That'll be OK. It's interesting to note. So that those are the real incidents that we can verify. Right. So we have mm -hmm. the, the types of haunts that people report and then we have the real incidents. I think it's worth noting that this swamp is not a part of any sort of protected wildlife refuge. There have been industrial factors that have chipped away at the habitat over the years, but the core of the swamp has stayed pretty undisturbed and has tons of native species and fossils. And I think that sort of prehistoric feel, right? Like you can still go into the swamp and feel completely removed from the modern world i think that mm -hmm. for me is what probably feeds its creepy reputation i do like the idea that it's a place that people were just not supposed to be yeah totally you think about all kinds of places there are places like this in the mountains linville gorge is one of these places there's a ton of places like this up in the high mountains there are a ton of places like this in swamps in south carolina a ton of places like this on the sea islands in south carolina the outer banks in north carolina where you just know that the landscape has never been convenient enough for there to be a lot of people there and there is just something alien about those places that is very compelling and also very disturbing. There was a whole genre of horror literature in the late 19th century that boiled down to, isn't nature weird? <laughs> and doesn't it feel like nature wants to hurt us? 
<laughs> and there's a lot of stories. Great God Pan, the Wendigo, things like that come from that genre of basically go too far into the woods and probably bad things are waiting for you there. And they are not terribly interested in human habitation of their spaces. And so I find those stories really compelling. Yeah. And I think that Bear Creek Swamp fits the bill. Absolutely. What's interesting to me, and I know I've said a lot of things are interesting to me. I'm repeating that a lot because it is interesting to me. Like, this is an interesting topic. There's no official protection, right? We established that. There's also no trespassing barriers. So there's a central connecting road and you can just go to the Bear Creek Swamp. Yeah. Like, you can just go there. You just drive in the middle of it. You just drive in the middle of it. If you want to go out there and tell somebody you got their baby, you can just go do it. If you want to go put your waders <laughs> on and go kick over logs looking for bodies, you can go do it. If you want to go put bodies in there, you can. <laughs> you should not do that. <laughs> Don't do that. We know it does not work. <laughs> Listen, we have given you proof that it does not work. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's accessible and it's still weird. Like that to me is really cool that it's yeah. so accessible and still so weird and undeveloped. Absolutely. Yeah. I love that about it. The Civil War ghosts particularly interest me in part because Alabama produced a lot of Union soldiers, actually. And so the stereotype assumption, the default bumper sticker version of history is, well, they were a Confederate state and everybody in it fought for the Confederacy. And that's just not true. The overwhelming majority of Alabama Unionists in the Army joined a cavalry unit that had thousands of people in it and were selected by Sherman to join him on the march to the sea. They were his personal accompaniment, basically, and it was thousands of cavalry soldiers. So they had a very active union recruitment and very active union military units coming from Alabama. It was a place with a lot of contention about what was happening. It was not a place where everybody felt the same way by any wild stretch. And there was not uniformity of belief in Alabama. And there was a right. lot of contention within communities. But yeah, man, that's the Bear Creek Swamp. It's this little microcosm of all this history and, and lore that we've talked about the, to the point that you just made about the Civil War. We've talked about that in the Carolinas. We mm -hmm. have talked about all these types of haunts in the Carolinas. And for me, this is a universally appealing and intriguing location because it's so consistent with other accounts and experiences that people report. It really sounds like if somebody has a particular type of paranormal thing that they love, then they can find an example of it in the Bear Creek Swamp. Let's play... Benefit of the doubt. And all of these occurrences legitimately have been perceived, right? Let's say that all the people that go there legitimately experience these stories. Yeah. Nobody's making it up. Nobody's making it up. To your point, what if what manifests is based on the person? I like that a lot. And it has more to do with that individual's untapped, mm -hmm. you know, or sub subconscious mind as to what they perceive. Yeah. If I were going to use it in a story, if that would be a very compelling and fun story to write and a very fun story to read, I think, where it's not that the place has any inherent feature, mm -hmm. but that it's this responsive medium that is sitting there waiting for a human to show up expecting something, and then it mm -hmm. will conjure whatever they expect, good or bad. And so I find that really enjoyable. It's like the opposite face of the coin of John Keel's theory of the ultra terrestrials. Mm -hmm. This guy who wrote the Mothman prophecies, he ultimately came to believe that there was some sort of entity in the world that was very trickster spirit. -y, and that entity basically just wanted to mess with us. Mm -hmm. And so it would just manifest as whatever would mess with the person it was manifesting for. Right. So in instead of it being like receptive to what somebody is looking for, it's, oh, I know how to press their buttons. And uh, I love that. Yeah. And I find both of those really interesting. And I like the idea of this as a place where that is true. I also think this is a place like, I'm not going to remember the name of it, when Dungeons and Dragons in the Forgotten Realms setting, there's the city of Waterdeep. And underneath Waterdeep, there's 700 levels of dungeon. And you can mm -hmm. get to them through the back of a bar. Mm -hmm. And I like it as that. I like it as a place where the, you just, whichever tree you walk around, whichever spot you park your car in, you get something different. There's no way to anticipate what experience I'll have, and it will never be the same as someone else's. Tales from the Awning Portal is an awesome expansion. 
Yes, I was never going to remember the name of it. <laughs> yeah, that's a fantastic expansion. That that's the pub, and in the middle of the it is the yawning portal. It's and they keep it boarded up, but <laughs> many adventurers go down the hole, and nobody comes out. The swamp would be a great place to have a story where people go into the swamp, and you just never know what's going to happen. Man, I miss playing tabletop games. Indeed, indeed, big same. But anyway, thank you for listening to this special Arcane Carolinas <laughs> Arcane Destinations. We are still here. We are making big plans for the fall. Yes, it's the spring, maybe early summer, depending on where you're at. But we are already planning our fall and it's going to be great. We're really excited about what's coming up. A lot of exciting things in the pipeline. Happy you're here. Thanks for being a part of our community. Yeah. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening. You've been listening to Arcane Carolinas. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed it. For more episodes, behind the scenes information, and links to our social media, check out www.arcanecarolinas.com, where you can also buy the Arcane Carolinas book. And if you like award-winning horror and science fiction, check out my books at michaelgwilliamsbooks.com or visit my publisher, Falstaff Books, at falstaffbooks.com. And if you have story suggestions, comments, or questions, email us at arcanecarolinas at gmail.com. And thanks for listening. The bear queen, the, 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 gosh, this one is going to be just chock full of us being tongue tied.